Good morning. My name is Joan James, and I'm here today to present my topic of how the open API spec led to better API design. I want to thank API the Docs for inviting me to speak today. I wish we could do this in person, but maybe sometime in the future. Before I begin, a little bit about my background. I, I have about three parts to my career. I started off out of college as a software engineer at Motorola Cellular Infrastructure Division in Schaumburg, Illinois. I was there for 20 years as a developer and later as a requirements engineer working on requirements for 3G core networks. When my son was about 10 years old, I became a stay-at-home mom. I went back to school. I was a part-time teacher. I taught piano lessons. I did all sorts of kid-friendly things. When the time came for my son to go to college, I returned to the corporate world and I went right back to Motorola where I was doing technical writing for 4G, public safety, LTE. Eventually I wound up at Zebra and somewhere along the way, I uh, started reading about API documentation and I thought, you know, this sounds like something I'd like to do. So I started educating myself on API documentation and Swagger in particular. So this is where my Zebra journey begins. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Zebra technology, so I'll just give you a little bit of background about it. You might know Zebra from barcode technology, maybe at your grocery store. There's a barcode scanner there made by Zebra. They also make RFID readers. They make mobile devices. They have locationing solutions. And now we have REST APIs enabling the cloud. Zebra Savannah is the enterprise platform that cloud enables Zebra. This is how we have connected devices used for communicating with the device and also for storing information about the device in the data platform. The developer portal gives access to our cloud APIs. Taking a closer look at the developer portal, Besides API documentation, we have blogs, we have case studies, we have support services, learning services, and all kinds of things to complement the APIs. And you can find that at developer.zebra.com. Drilling down a little more on the API documentation. Why do we have API documentation? API documentation is there to instruct the audience. It provides an overview of the API. It has use cases. It has descriptions of every call and parameter. We have to remember to address all types of audiences. There's developers, but there's all kinds of developers. There's internal developers, external developers, newcomers. There's debuggers, system architects, people who make decisions about using the API. This particular API on this page is one of our free APIs you might be interested in trying. It's called UPC Lookup. So if you've got something sitting around on your desk, like maybe this bottle of water, you can plug in the uh, UPC code in there and find out about it. You can find out lots of things about that bottle of water. It's pretty, pretty interesting, I think. And uh, I wanted to say that page on the top is the part that's generated from the open API spec. There's lots of other types of API documentation solutions that are around there. But the one that we chose was the open API spec. The open API spec is for REST APIs. It's a standard that was developed around 10 years ago and eventually became owned by the Smart Bear company. It was called Swagger originally. It's a language agnostic interface for RESTful APIs. You might have heard the word Swagger used in reference to tools because the Swagger spec was taken over by the Open API initiative and they changed the name to the Open API spec so as not to confuse it with the tool set that Smart Bear uh, offers that has the word Swagger in it. It's a machine readable API definition. It's represented in either YAML or JSON format. The latest version is 3.0. The benefits of using the open API spec is that it can be the single source of truth for your API structure. 
That's not always the case because of the way that the spec is sometimes generated, but it's a good place to have the single source of truth, but that's something you have to work out with your organization. The developers provide the descriptions in the open API spec. In my case, I had to review those descriptions and I had to change them. I, I attempted to change the descriptions in the code in one case, but um, that didn't always work out really well because of the, of the, um, the tools that were used to generate the open API spec were not really very good. The open API spec is an API first design enabler. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more later. It's a stable implementation. As I said, it's been around for 10 years. There's numerous tools available based on the open API spec. There's editors, there's plugins, there's code generators, there's mocking tools, all sorts of things. There's different types of rendering engines. So why do we want API first design? Now that we have the open API spec before any code is developed, we can provide some type of governance on this spec. Well, you might ask, how could this be done? In my case at Zebra, I am part of the API management team, which is comprised of a product manager, a program manager, the developer portal owner, and the engineers that develop the proxies on the Apigee platform. We all learned about the open API spec together. The team is very supportive of my role, which has helped me gain the trust of the API developers. So let's explore the API management process a little bit more and see how does that work? How can we get feedback on the open API spec before any code is written? Now that I will say that this is not exactly how we, what our process looks like, but this is somewhat of a goal. The entrance criteria for the API management process is the open API spec. What we want to do is have some type of a customized linter. We don't have such a thing now, but we have certain requirements that have been done to the open API spec before we begin any type of work on it. We're in the process of developing a naming requirement before we do anything with the spec. And by naming, I mean the name of the, uh, the API product and the base path URL name. Because as you will find out, and as I found out, the more APIs you have, the more you realize that you should have had a master plan on the naming of your URLs, your base path, as they would call it in uh, the open API spec. So once we have our open API spec, the developers can develop in parallel. And then as you go from one phase to the other, you can have test criteria for your code. You can have test criteria for your open API spec because remember, once you post that spec and it's rendered on your developer portal, there's a button to try it out. And the developers, I found out, they don't really care about that button because they know that somebody's going to be writing code to call that REST API. And so I've had to enforce testing of the documentation. So we're, we're treating the open API spec as though it were code. In this first bubble here, we have the developers developing, perhaps me, the API documentation person, I'm gathering inputs for what we call supplemental documentation that enhances the API documentation that comes from the spec. Before we release it publicly, we have final reviews of all the documentation and the developers have their own final testing that's done and there's a whole checklist of things they have to go through. Taking a closer look at the open API spec, I, I mentioned that it was a contract, but you know, I'm a, I'm a musician, I'm a piano teacher. I also think of this like an orchestra score. You know, everybody thinks that with the concept of agile and minim, minimum viable product and all that, there's a lot of developers who wanna code first and have their minimum viable product because that's the way they've been taught to do their development. But if you think about it, what if you had an orchestra? I live near Chicago. What if the Chicago Symphony Orchestra showed up and the musicians all just sat down and played whatever they wanted? Or maybe a few of them got together, three or four of them, and they agreed what they were going to do, and they all came together. 
And then, well, let's just write that. Let's just write the music down later. Well, that's not going to work, right? So I think of this as another analogy of a contract. It's an agreement between multiple parties that they're going to march to the same drummer. So what if there are problems in the spec? And this is where I got on my journey of teaching myself REST API and best practices and trying to promote it within Zebra. So what kind of problems you might ask? The URL structure. Suppose their, their APIs are very similar to someone else's APIs, but their, their URL structure is completely different. What if they use a different method of versioning? There's all kinds of ways that you can version. You can put a version in the path. You can put it in a uh, query parameter. You could do some type of negotiation. What if they're doing it in a completely different way as the rest of the company? Resource naming. That is the part of the path that comes after your fully qualified domain name. And you need to have a master plan for resource naming. And you need to know some basic rules about um, the resource naming. Like, for example, you shouldn't put a verb in the resource name. It should be nouns in most cases. The parameter names, you want to have consistent parameter naming, like from one API to another. If you're talking about the same thing, you want to use the same word. Also, you want to have conventions for naming so that the user finds it easy to guess if you left something out. They say, oh, well, Zebra did it this way before, so maybe it means this or that because that's the way they've always done it. Then there's how you use headers. You need to have agreement on the use of headers. The error responses should be documented. They should be used in the same way. You don't want to use a silly response code because you think it's cute. Okay, you want to use the standard ones. Then there's authentication. You want to have agreement on what type of scenarios you'll use, what type of authentication. So at Zebra, we had a um, we had a handbook, a design handbook for REST APIs, and someone created it when we started on the journey of cloud APIs. And it was a very good tutorial, but it didn't have these kinds of things in there. Like, how do you name parameters? I can't tell you how many email threads I've been involved in where people were discussing parameter naming. It's so easy to just say, this is the way we're going to do it and have everyone do the same thing. So we had an as an architect team that had a process of submitting problem statements and uh, success criteria for problem statements. So the, the scrum team that I was working with suggested that I create a problem statement for the architect team. So I did. I took the problem statement, many of this, it included many of the things I already mentioned, and I presented it to the architecture team and we put together a task group that met twice a week for about a month. And we addressed all the issues in our problem statement. And most of these people were API designers and architects and me, the technical writer. Now, I've been a developer before. The people on this team didn't know that. The technology has changed since I was a developer. But there are many things that are still the same. Like I didn't use Git when I was a developer, but I used something that was similar. So I kind of knew what it was. I kind of knew how it worked. It, that's for example. So what I did was um, I, I was more like a facilitator and I was the person that updated the document. So this is very similar to being a technical writer. You know, you meet with your subject matter experts and you update documents, right? So what I did is I, I chose topics for each person on the team and they would present some ideas and some of their research on the topic at hand. Present it to the rest of the group and everyone discussed it. I recorded the meetings and I helped them come to a consensus. And then I documented it. I also presented a topic and my topic was my favorite topic, parameter naming. <laughs> this is the one that really got me. When you are the technical writer and you are updating the open API spec, mainly what you're doing is you're updating titles and summaries and descriptions, but you don't touch the stuff that has to match the code. So I never felt like I was able to change the parameter names, but I saw many parameter names that were not very good. For example, a single letter, 
Now, when I was a developer and I worked with uh, microprocessors, memory was a concern, but I don't think memory is necessarily a concern now for a parameter name. I mean, surely you can afford eight characters for a parameter name. Another one that got me was uh, prepositions for parameter names. When I tried to write a description about the to parameter, I ended up having the word to twice in a row, and it was very difficult to, to describe the to parameter. Just so happens in that particular case, I was able to open up a bug ticket on JIRA for the naming of the parameter. And the developers were very, very happy to uh, take my recommendations. I was very surprised. Um, and so we fixed that problem. And it, it kind of empowered me a little bit. So this was my contribution. Well, one of my contributions to the, uh, the task force is parameter naming. And I did a lot of research. Uh, Stack Overflow was a good source for me. I looked at Google. I looked at lots of different websites that were recommended to me, API um, developer websites. So the query parameter, what we decided was the query parameter would be camel case. And I ran into a lot of, not a lot, but a few people who questioned that. But the, the reasoning was, um, now you may have a server that isn't case sensitive, but uh, usually you have an agreement with the other party that's using your API on this parameter. So camel case is okay for the query parameter, which comes at the end of the endpoint. And no one is ever gonna type that in. That the, the problem with having mixed case in the, the fully qualified domain name is that people might just type it in. It's, it's not necessarily generated by software. And so they're, they're gonna have a tendency to misuse the case. But no one's ever gonna type in or they shouldn't type in the query parameter manually. The path parameter is part of the URL. And the path parameter is um, often contains a, like some type of a key for a database, for example. Um, I have an example elsewhere about collections of pets. So let's say you have the pet ID is part of the path parameter. And the naming of that is only for documentation because the actual ID becomes part of the path. And I forgot to mention that uh, query parameters tend to be like um, a filter or something like that when you're filtering out the results. The header parameters, uh, you don't have a lot of leeway on the naming of the header parameters because you have to have agreement with that on, um, with the server on that one. The body parameters are also for documentation only. And I have a famous quote here that I have heard from developers. The two hardest things in computer science is cache invalidation and naming things, which was supposedly said by someone named Phil Carlton. I hear maybe he doesn't exist or maybe he never said that, but I think it's a good quote. Another thing that we had to agree on was HTTP status codes. And the list I have here are the ones that we felt, felt were the most common. The server errors are not something that you want to happen. And this may be a matter of personal choice, but I don't document the 500 uh, error code because that's something that you want to perform some type of root ca cause analysis and don't release the software with an error like that. And I would think that by documenting that, you're saying that it might happen, which is not a good thing. If it did happen, I think it's easy to look it up and know what it is. What I found is in the uh, open API spec very often that these, these um, status codes are missing and they should be there if they're possible. Other aspects that need agreement are versioning. As I mentioned before, there's lots of different ways to do versioning. Headers, I'm not really gonna talk about all the different types of headers. The use of methods. I'll give you an example about methods. Um, in our documentation, we tend to use the, what they call the CRUD verbs when describing the methods. That would be change, retrieve, update, or delete. Resource naming, there's different approaches to resource naming. This is a whole subject unto itself. You could give an entire presentation on resource naming. Um, and it's 
for REST APIs, it's very important to um, do this the right way. And it's, it's also very helpful to the users of your APIs because once you have good resource naming, they're going to know what to do. You're going to know what to do with the HTTP method types. If you try to put verbs in the, um, the resource name, then people have to learn what your verbs are. They don't automatically know how to do a get or a post or whatever. The other thing about method types is um, that you would want consistency on is there are some developers that have a tendency to want to do something like this. They do a get with a request body. Why would you have a request body? You would get a response body back. And the reason that they're doing that is because for some reason they don't want to use the query string or a path parameter because they think that it's not protected. So that's why people do things like that. But the problem with that is that the tools sometimes won't accept that in your open API spec. So it's just not really a good thing to do. Um, authentication, I mentioned already. And also you want to have um, an attitude among your your developers that using REST best practices is a good thing. And I found, I, by surprise, I found out that most people really wanted to do it the right way and they wanted to learn more about it. And everybody comes from a different place and has a different, different uh, type of knowledge about it and nobody knows it all. We're all learning it together. So I found that that helped me to work with um, the developers on this. So if I had to do this all over again, of course, you know what they say about hindsight. Here's some of the things I would do. So if you're thinking about having your very first developer portal, maybe you'll benefit from this, but you wanna establish the API naming early. When we first started working on this, um, we only had you know one or two or three APIs. It didn't seem like a big deal. Also the resource URL naming, for example, pet store, animals, dogs, that type of thing. You wanna have some kind of a master plan, especially for the first word, that word pet store. Establishing parameter naming conventions is also a good thing to do first. And after going through this for a year, it was a year ago when I first became a member of the API management team, more than ever, I convinced myself that API first design is a really worthy goal. If you're just getting started with the open API spec, here are some resources that you might wanna use. I found some really excellent classes on LinkedIn and they keep getting better all the time. A year ago, there weren't so many, now there's lots of them. They're all really good. I've been reading a lot of books. Generally, the ones that are the most recent are the best, but you know, you might find an older book that has a really good description of resource naming. So that's something to consider too. And tools that work with the open API spec, one of them that's really popular right, right now is Stoplight. Then there's a lot of tools that, are, that have the word swagger in them that are also out there. So I wanna thank you again for inviting me today. I hope that you will all look for me on LinkedIn and I look forward to meeting you hopefully someday at an API The Docs session. Maybe it'll be in Chicago, I hope. Thank you.